Um, welcome everyone to the launch of the EDO's latest report, Empowering the EPA to Prevent Climate Pollution. My name is Jamila Hallinan and I'm the Head of Legal Education here at the EDO. And I'm coming to you from Gadigal land. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Today, you're going to hear firstly from our CEO, David Morris, who will talk briefly about the context for this report and some of the safe climate work that the EDO undertakes. Then our senior solicitor, Saren Lohan, will outline our vision for how the EPA can use its powers and various legislative tools to reduce the risk of harm to human health and the environment from greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Also with us today is Rachel Wormsley, who's our Head of Policy and Law Reform, and she's on hand to help Sarah and answer any questions that you might have. Um, when it comes to questions, if you could use the Q&A function, which is you should find at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions, I will collate those and ask them at the end of the presentation. So I'll hand you over to David, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Jem, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. It's always a, a, a strange feeling presenting to what is essentially a slide on your screen, but um, uh, thank you for joining us. It's an important day, and I'm really, really proud of the work that the team has done to put together this report. I think it has the same uh, superlative qualities that our previous reports have been uh, described in that way by the Minister, and I think this one has that. Uh, I wanted to give a, a quick introduction to the Environmental Defenders Office, which I'm lucky enough to lead. Uh, and I wanted to go back in time a little bit and, and describe the creation of these magnificent institutions some 30 years ago. They were established uh, between 1985 and 1991, um, which was the, the bold dream then of having essentially a legal centre on call to help people protect the environment. Uh, we continue to pursue that bold dream uh, and to ensure the longevity of success and to indeed write the next chapter in the success story of the EDOs, uh, we came together all eight uh, existing, pre-existing environmental defenders offices around Australia last year and merged um, to form the largest public interest environmental law centre in the Australia Pacific region. Um, we provide legal solutions for people's nature and our climate and our sort of big picture vision is a world where nature thrives. Um, we see a number of things as preconditions to that occurring. And one of them is effective action on climate change. We uh, have designed our new structure around three pillars, really. Fundamentally, we're looking at achieving a healthy environment and justice for people. And in a climate context, uh, that work will look at adaptation to the new world. Um, it'll look at remedies for uh, actions which have caused harm to our climate and to people, and it will look at, at justice. We know that uh, the way climate change impacts will uh, they'll be unevenly distributed and they will burden uh, the vulnerable and community disproportionately. Uh, the second part of our program is looking to achieve systemic change. And for us, uh, in respect of climate change, that means work that uh, drives mitigation of climate emissions and makes more risky the types of activities which are driving a worsening and a worsening climate, a move away from what we know is required to achieve a, a safe climate system. And when I describe a safe climate system, some people would say that I shouldn't describe it in that way because even uh, the goals set in the Paris Agreement come, uh, are occasioned with some very dire consequences for both people and nature. The third pillar is our work with First Nations and Indigenous peoples, both in Australia and across the Pacific. Um, ensuring that we, uh, we partner with them and we work with them um, in, in a way that is uh, both respectful and also um, effective in terms of helping them protect country and culture. I think that we can now go on to the next slide, but, but uh, we, we finalised our merger in late last year. This has been a, a really fundamental change for us as an organisation. It sets us, sets us up uh, to grapple with some of these mega challenges um, the ongoing climate crisis and, of course, the um, sort of linked crisis, but not exclusively linked to climate change crisis of uh, biodiversity collapse and um, extinction of species. The quote on your screen uh, is from the State of the Environment report in New South Wales in 2018. It, it really just stands for what is now a very well accepted proposition. The climate is changing, the world is warming and humans are causing it. 
I think from that three questions flow. The first is, so what? Um, and most of us, and I suspect most of you on this uh, webinar here today have come to the conclusion, oh, it's bad. I think to the next two questions then flow, what do we do about it? Uh, and how fast do we need to do it? I wanna turn uh, first to the consequences and impacts on nature, which I think have been brought into stark relief by a number of things. First, some reports. Uh, I think the IPCC reports, the special report, particularly into what a global annual rise of 1.5 degrees means. Um, some of those uh, impacts which they express with high certainty at 1.5 degrees in terms of impacts to, Great, uh, impacts to the Great Barrier Reef and other reefs around the world, um, but also just our lived experience. I think that's the difference now. We're not just reading it in reports. Um, we're now feeling it. There was that um, uh, almost um, prophetic uh, report by, uh, I believe it was um, Garneau in uh, some years ago, which um, predicted that we would start to experience the worsening impacts of our fire seasons by 2020, that we would start to be able to observe those things. And of course, uh, last summer, um, really the, the horrors of last summer was a, was a horrible bringing to bear of that prediction. We're also starting to see worsening impacts of a drying landscape and, you know, many of the uh, quite moving uh, case studies you'll read in this report are from people who are living with and experiencing climate change in their day to day lives. Um, we know that if, if you want to go into the detail, you can go to any number of reports, including this one, and it, it really um, sets out the litany of horrors uh, that are stacking up in front of us if we don't take urgent action to address this problem. Uh, longer and hotter summers and a consequent uh, correspondingly longer fire season, less rainfall, coastal inundation and erosion, um, increased pressures on species, the list really does go on. Um, Jim, if you could go to the, the next slide. Um, the, the impacts aren't going to be confined to the natural environment either. Uh, they will be very much brought to bear on humans, both in terms of the social, economic and human health toll that they will take. Uh, we know that wildfires and increased wildfires, we're starting to see really early research into what, that, uh, what impact that is having and, and particularly smoke, what impact smoke is having on human health. Um, some early research coming out of California, but linking increased and unsurprising um, respiratory problems, um, mental health problems and heat related illness. Um, but we're going to see impacts on our economic sectors as well. Things like impacts to tourism and agriculture, um, impacts where our infrastructure is not built for the type of heat and type of extreme weather events that we need. Um, these are things that are going to really um, dictate much of what we live with over the next, uh, well, really from, from now and into the future. We know that they're already having a significant impact on people, communities and landscapes in New South Wales. And, Again, last summer was, was just a, a really in your face um, representation of that. So I think you answer the questions, um, it's bad, what do we need to do? Well, we need to have urgent and rapid reductions. Um, and Preston in one of the uh, really important cases that the EDO ran, the Rocky Hill case, which challenged a proposed coal mine for the small town in the Upper Hunter of Gloucester, um, said that this is a kind of problem that can't be dealt with without multiple local actions. And I think one of the things that excites me about this report is it represents uh, one of those local actions that can be taken in this instance by the EPA. Uh, they have the tools available to them. Hopefully this report goes some way to empowering them. Uh, it complements Minister Keane's roadmap, which uh, I think we ought to congratulate the government and indeed all MPs that voted for that uh, bill that passed through an epic session of Parliament last night. Um, this report and the uh, recommendations that we make within it really complement that and the leadership that's being start shown by state governments uh, in terms of reducing emissions and, and changing the dial on, on where we're going and how quickly we're getting there. I, I think that uh, in terms of the urgency of it, I, I was reflecting on a story um, from a, a friend of mine who was involved in the recent Royal Commission. Um, and I think it's, it's also interesting that 
in any normal year, that Royal Commission report would have been front and centre and in the news for a long period of time. And in this pandemic affected year, uh, it hasn't got the exposure that it possibly deserved. But really the, the urgency of this problem hit home for my friend when he realised that last summer uh, was not going to be an aberration or an anomaly, that it was going to become the kind of summer that we live with year in, year out. Um, it's a bringing home to bear of what I think someone described as the best layman's way they could talk about climate change, which was that summer is going to go from something we love and crave in this country to something that we fear. Um, I'm really excited about this report because of what it represents. Um, it, it is an outlining of the powers that exist to do something about this problem to drive rapid and urgent reductions in greenhouse gas emissions in New South Wales. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to pass over to Sarah and to go into more detail about the report and our recommendations. Thanks. Thanks, David. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be speaking to you today from the beautiful Dharawal country on the south coast of New South Wales. And I pay my respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. So I'm talking to you today about the key ideas and recommendations in our new report, but I must warn you before I start uh, that being a policy lawyer, I tend to get bogged down in the detail. And so I apologise in advance if I put you to sleep somewhere between the discussion on licence conditions and uh, emissions trading schemes. And if that's the case, don't worry, because you can always go uh, to our website. The report's now available up there and I've got the link here on the first slide as so you can go back and read it in your own time. But what I'm hoping today is that the key message from our discussion resonates with you. And that is this, that the New South Wales EPA can and should be reducing greenhouse gas emissions during, through its existing regulatory frameworks, driving us towards a net zero economy consistent with a safe climate. So it may come as a surprise to some people that the EPA doesn't actually regulate greenhouse gas emissions. It regulates pollution, air pollution, but not necessarily uh, carbon dioxide, methane or other greenhouse gas emissions. It may also come as a surprise to some of you that the EPA does have pretty broad powers when it comes to regulating pollution and waste, and it could potentially take steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions using existing powers and functions in environmental protection legislation. But I might just start at the beginning and talk to you a little bit about the EPA. So the EPA was established under the Protection of the Environment Administration Act in 1991, um, but it's been through various iterations in its time since its inception. For example, in 2003, the EPA was rolled into a new Department of Environment and Conservation together with other environment agencies, and that reflected a shift in government priorities from pollution prevention to conservation, and it saw the EPA with somewhat reduced autonomy. But then in 2011, there was a major pollution incident at Kurugang Island in Newcastle, and that triggered reforms by the New South Wales government, which saw the EPA re-established as an independent authority and given enhanced powers, including in relation to the regulation of pollution. And importantly, the EPA is the lead environmental regulator in New South Wales. Its key functions and powers are set out in a separate piece of legislation, the Protection of the Environment Operations Act. So if we look at the objectives of the EPA, which are set out in section six of the Protection of the Environment Administration Act, they include to protect, restore, and enhance the quality of the environment in New South Wales, and to reduce the risks to human health and prevent the degradation of the environment. Now, given what we've already heard from David about climate change and the impacts that climate change is already having in New South Wales, it would be consistent with the EPA's objectives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to reduce risks to human health and prevent the degradation of the environment. I also just wanna to quickly touch briefly on the idea that greenhouse gas emissions are pollution or waste. So while the regulation of air pollution is not a new thing, historically regulated air pollutants have not included greenhouse gas emissions. However, this is changing, particularly as we understand more about the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions and it's also reflected in an important case that came out of the US, Massachusetts first, the US EPA, which found that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions are air pollutants under the US Clean Air Act and therefore can be regulated by the US EPA. But just turning our minds back to New South Wales, let's have a look at um, the definitions in the Protection of the Environment Operations Act here. So air pollution means the emission into the air of any air impurity 
and air impurity includes smoke, dust, cinders, solid particles of any kind, gases, fumes, mists, odors, and radioactive substances. Waste is defined as any substance, whether solid, liquid, or gas that is discharged, emitted, or deposited in the environment in such volume, constituency, or manner as to cause an alteration in the environment. So with those definitions in mind, reducing greenhouse gas emissions through pollution and waste laws acknowledges their impacts on the climate, health, environment, and human health. So now I'm gonna get into a bit more of a technical discussion about what the EPA could be doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So as I said before, the EPA has pretty broad powers to regulate pollution and waste. So some of the things that the EPA can do under existing legislation is that it can implement schemes for economic measures. These are things such as emission trading schemes or green offset schemes. It can put conditions on environment protection licenses. It can develop guidelines or policies on pollution waste and waste regulation. It can enforce pollution standards that are set out in legislation or regulation. It can impose pollution reduction programs on licensees to prevent and control pollution from licensed facilities. And it can draft protection of the environment policies that provide an overarching framework for protecting the environment in New South Wales. So I'm going to talk to each of these mechanisms in a bit more detail now. The tables that follow have quite a bit of information in them. So don't feel like you need to digest it all here. The table is in our report and you can go back and look at it in your own time. So the first mechanism I wanna talk about are schemes for economic measures. So part 9.3 of the Protection of the Environment Operation Act provides that the EPA may develop and implement schemes involving economic measures to achieve environmental regulation or environment protection. And then the Act actually provides examples of what those schemes could be. And that includes a tradable emission scheme or a greens offset scheme. Now on our reading, the powers in the legislation are quite broad. The legislation envisages that a scheme developed by the EPA could be implemented by conditions on environment protection licenses, which I'll talk about shortly. So the provisions around tradable emission schemes have been used, for example, to formalise the Hunter River Salinity Trading Scheme, a cap and trade scheme that regulates the discharge of saline industrial pollution into the New South Wales Hunter River. It's a market-based credit scheme that does that. The provisions in the legislation could potentially be used to set up an emissions trading scheme for greenhouse gas emissions for industries regulated by the New South Wales EPA. The legislation also provides an opportunity for the EPA to develop green offset schemes. And again, this could potentially be used to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. However, in general, we would caution against the reliance on offset schemes to justify environmental harm as they rarely deliver the positive environmental outcomes intended. However, the overarching point in relation to these types of schemes is that they are within the remit of the New South Wales EPA. So the next mechanism I wanna talk about is environment protection licenses. So chapter three of the Protection of the Environment Operation Act sets out a framework for regulating polluting activities through environment protection licenses. So scheduled activities being those in schedule one of the act must have a pollution license, which can cover one or more forms of pollution. So air, water, noise pollution. And the EPA has broad powers to attach conditions to environment protection licenses. For example, they put limits on the amount of noise that can be emitted from a licensed facility, or they require licensees to monitor pollutants. It is an offence under the legislation if you fail to comply with the license conditions. So there are a number of ways in which the EPA could potentially use license conditions as a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The first would be to impose limits on emissions via conditions. So the EPA currently does this in relation to things like noise, waste, odour, hours of operation and through pollution concentration limits. If, for example, concentrations of a pollutant that can be discharged at a certain point. The EPA could seek to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by imposing emission limits on EPLs. The EPA could develop a guideline or policy that outlines how greenhouse gas emissions can be assessed and reduced and could set standards that could then be imposed via conditions on environment protection licenses. Another thing it could do through this mechanism is to implement pollution reduction programs via license conditions. So a pollution reduction program sets out measures for preventing, controlling, abating or mitigating pollution. It could require facilities to carry out works or use certain equipment to reduce emissions. A pollution reduction program could outline specific actions required by a licensed facility to prevent, control, abate or mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, 
the existing load-based licensing scheme is also implemented via conditions on environment protection licences. So the load-based licensing scheme regulates pollutants by imposing a specific licence fee on certain pollutants emitted by certain industries, and it also establishes load-based limits for certain pollutants from certain industries. This is a scheme that's already in operation in New South Wales. A review of the load-based licensing scheme was commenced in 2016, but has not yet been finalised. And as part of that review, EDO has recommended that greenhouse gas emissions be added as a regulated pollutant under the load-based licensing scheme. So the next thing I wanna talk about is pollution, waste and standard limits. So I've already talked about the idea that the EPA could use conditions on licenses to impose um, limits on greenhouse gas emissions. The EPA could do this by developing a guideline or a policy that outlines how greenhouse gas emissions could be assessed and reduced and could set standards consistent with that guideline. This is a way that the New South Wales EPA currently regulates industrial noise, for example. Alternatively, the limits could be imposed directly in the regulation or legislation. So part 5.4 of the Act and the Protection of the Environment Operations Clean Air Regulation currently regulate certain emissions from wood heaters, fires, motor vehicles, fuels and industry. The regulation prescribes a standard or limit and non-compliance with those standards is an offence under the Act. So the, the Protection of the Environment Operations Clean Air Regulation could be amended to prescribe standards for greenhouse gas emissions that must be met by scheduled activities or at the very least by those activities that are the highest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, including electricity generation. So this was something that was done in the US under the Obama administration, which introduced carbon pollution standards for fossil fuel power plants. These were performance standards that set a maximum allowable carbon dioxide emissions per unit of electricity. The Trump administration had proposed changes to those standards. However, the last time we checked, those standards hadn't been finalised. And lastly, I just want to talk about protection of the environment policies. So the Protection of the Environment Operations Act sets out a framework for the preparation and making of protection environment policies, or PEPs. The idea behind these is that they further the, the objectives of the EPA and manage cumulative impacts on the environment from existing and future activities. So the EPA can initiate the preparation of a draft PEP in its own right, or it may be directed to prepare a PEP by the Minister. Ultimately, the PEP is made by the governor or on the recommendation of the minister. A PEP must do one of the following things. It must include an environment protection goal or an environment protection standard, an environment protection guideline or an environment protection protocol. Interestingly, although the framework for PEPs has been in the legislation since its inception, to date, no PEPs have been declared. Yet it seems like the issue of climate change caused by the cumulative impacts of excessive greenhouse gas emissions and when it and which affects all people in the community is exactly the type of issue that a PEP was intended to deal with. And I just want to quickly read a quote from the then Minister for the Environment, the Honourable Pam Allen, when she introduced the legislation around PEPs. She said, these policies will enable the government to deal more effectively, effectively with the cumulative impacts of development by setting out the ambient environmental goals that the entire community is striving for. So the EPA could draft a PEP that addresses climate change and the regulation of greenhouse gas emissions. It could set science-based statewide goals and standards and assist in managing cumulative impacts and achieving long-term outcomes. The PEP could also identify mechanisms for achieving those goals. And those mechanisms could be implemented by the EPA itself, for example, through the regulation of greenhouse gas emissions as a pollutant or by other agencies. And under the Act, a PEP must be taken into consideration by decision makers when making certain decisions under the Act. Other environmental protection legislation, the Environment Planning and Assessment Act, or by public authorities exercising certain functions. Because it is a statutory instrument, it has the potential to be more effective than a non-legislative policy made by the government of the day. So there was quite a lot of detail in there about the powers and tools that exist in the legislation. And as I said, it's spelt out in a lot more detail in the report. And having considered those various mechanisms that would be available to the EPA to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, our report makes a number of recommendations, which I'll just walk you through now. 
So our first recommendation is that the EPA adopts an environmental protection goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions consistent with efforts to limit global average temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And then in order to achieve that goal, we then recommend that the EPA puts a price on carbon. And this is consistent with the polluter pays principle, a principle of ESD, which is incorporated into the EPA's objectives. So consistent with the polluter principle, the EPA puts a price on carbon and it can do this either through one of those schemes for econ economic measures that I talked about earlier, such as an emissions trading scheme, or it could do it through its load-based licensing scheme. It could expand the scheme to include greenhouse gas emissions with appropriate fees and limits being applied to emissions under that scheme. Recommendation three, the EPA can look at other mechanisms to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, including ones I've spoken to earlier, in relation to putting conditions on licences, introducing pollution reduction programs, or putting statutory limits in place within its regulations. Now, not all of these mechanisms would necessarily be needed, but it would be necessary to ensure that the regulatory framework as a whole leads to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, we recommend that the EPA prepares and recommends the making of a protection of the environment policy to address the transition to a zero carbon economy and prevent climate change impacts on human health and the environment in New South Wales. And we talk about a number of things that the, e that the PEP could do, but most importantly, it could contain that overarching environmental protection goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions consistent with efforts to limit global average temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, I know that was a lot to take in and I apologise for that, but what we'll do now is I'll pass it over to Jem, who's been monitoring the Q&A throughout this session, and we'll try and answer some of the questions that you might have. Thanks, Sarah, and we do have a couple of questions. Um, we'll start with Jo, who asks, who who drives the drafting of PEPs and who makes the final decision about enacting them? Great, thanks, Jo. So um, a draft PEP can be initiated by the EPA in its own right, or the minister can direct the EPA to draft a PEP. But at the end of the day, it's the EPA would need to recommend the making of that PEP to the minister and the PEP would ultimately be made by the governor on the recommendation of the minister. And I guess this is related to that question, Saren, but Reese asks that, you know, to what extent, I guess, do we rely on the minister um, to support these initiatives of the EPA? That's a good question, Reese. Um, so look, the mechanisms in the legislation, the powers that I've been talking about are already there in the legislation. So the EPA has pretty broad powers around what it can do for pollution and waste regulation. Now, some of the things I mentioned, such as putting a standard in the regulation would need um, you know, a change to the regulation supported by the minister. Other things the EPA could probably do, such as putting licenses on conditions. But at the end of the day, you know, the EPA's job is going to be made easier if it's got the support of the government who's willing to support its work in this area. Not sure if David or Rachel wanted to say anything more on that point. Uh, thanks, Saren. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, in my view, one of the powerful things about this report is that it does actually detail significant powers that exist in our laws at the moment, because a lot of people can get quite disheartened with climate law reform, thinking we'll never get a climate change act or, you know, it's such hard work. If you look at New South Wales Parliament this week, it took over 30 hours of debate to get the the electricity infrastructure investment bill through with attempts to stymie that by 249 amendments. But that actually passed with cross-party support in the end. So I think we're stepping closer and closer to actually getting legislative form, reform. But still, at the moment, we're not quite there yet. So we really do need to look at what can be done under existing powers. What can be done by policies, guidelines, conditions, that doesn't necessarily need to have that political fight in a parliament at the moment. And one of the, the things about this report is it does detail a lot of those options of what can be done. 
Uh, and as David said at the beginning, we've got, um, we do have a, a, an environment minister at the moment who is showing leadership and is showing aspiration of what needs to be done. The powers are there. So this really is a great opportunity to empower the EPA to, to use these existing provisions and do what can be done while we're still waiting for that big picture climate law reform. Thanks, Rachel. Um, we have a question also from Anne, um, which relates to how um, the planning laws relate to some of these initiatives. Anne comments that state significant development and state significant infrastructure provisions in our planning laws uh, limit the power of the EPA to some extent to regulate construction and operations and would like you to comment on, on that, the interaction between those two. Uh, that's a good question, Anne. Um, you're right that um, in terms of state significant development and state significant infrastructure, there are, are some limitations in the planning law as to um, licence conditions that can be put in place by the EPA. Um, but we would say, I guess, that through, during that assessment process, the EPA has the ability to raise its concerns. And if it had in place guidelines and policies that could be considered by decision makers, those guidelines and policies could potentially um, be extended to decision makers under the um, planning system. And I guess the point with um, the protection of the environment policy that I mentioned, if uh, the EPA was to draft one of those, decision makers would be required to consider what was in a PEP um, under the Environment Planning and Assessment Act. So there are ways in which we could strengthen the interaction between what the EPA is doing under pollution and waste regulation and the process of environmental assessment under the Planning Act. I agree it's not perfect, but there are opportunities to strengthen that and to marry those up better. A PEP would be one way of doing that because it would be an overarching policy that would apply across the board to decision makers. Um, I'm also thinking of things like the, um, the noise policy that the EPA has, while not perfect, it is something that's considered by decision makers under the planning system. So again, another opportunity for the EPA's work to be drawn into environmental impact assessment under the Planning Act. Uh, Lil has a couple of questions. The first is um, she, she makes the observation that you would need the technology for licensees to be able to measure or monitor their greenhouse gas emissions and she would like to know if, there, if this technology exists. Should I start on this one? No one else is jumping in. Um, that's a good question, Lil. Um, I guess as lawyers, we're looking at the legal mechanisms in the legislation for what the EPA could do. I think this type of question is probably a better thing to be asked of a scientist or an engineer. I know, I guess what we would say is in designing any scheme, you would need input from scientists, economic experts, engineers about how it could be done. Um, look, I think that in terms of the technology for monitoring things, we do have, you know, um, national systems in place for monitoring greenhouse gas emissions. And so there is some technology there, but again, it would be part of the design of the scheme in the end. Um, David or Rachel, did you have anything more to say on that? Right. No, I think you've answered it well, Sarah. So a, a second question from Lil is, are these discretionary functions and powers of the EPA or could the EPA be compelled to exercise these functions? Look, I might uh, jump in and answer this one, uh, Lil. We, we currently have a, a, a piece of litigation before the courts and I don't seek to comment on it, but it, it goes to that question. Um, and so I, I'd prefer to just uh, leave it as a, um, an unanswered question for now. Thanks. Okay. Um, I haven't had a chance to, to have a look at these ones in any detail, so I'm just going to read them. <laughs> a recent IPCC report on short-lived climate pollutants, short-lived climate pollutants, states there needs to be considerable cuts in emissions of black carbon, methane um, and HFCs um, if they, we are to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, traditional greenhouse emissions inventories underplay the importance of these um, short-lived climate pollutants because um, they're based on a timeline of 100 years instead of the critical amount of time we have left to avoid 
global warming. How does the EDO's policy paper address the issue of the cutting both of CO2 and short-lived carbon pollution emissions based on an appropriate timescale rather than the 100 years on which traditional greenhouse inventories are based? That's from Dorothy. Thanks, Dorothy. It's quite a detailed question. So um, our report talks about greenhouse gas emissions broadly. So we're not focused solely on carbon dioxide um, and short-lived climate pollutants potentially fall within the scope of you know, the greenhouse gas emissions that our report talks about. But again, I think this is kind of getting down to the detail of the design of a scheme and how it would be implemented. Um, we're focusing on the legal mechanisms, but yes, we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions broadly and not just the traditional greenhouse gas emissions, but I would leave it up to um, you know, the scientists designing the scheme to, to consider a bit more about how a scheme could potentially differentiate between those two types of pollutants. Okay, we have an anonymous question here, um, which is, uh, is there any scope for managing wood heater emissions? Um, this person points out that there has been some studies that show that uh, log burning stoves speed up global warming as well as harming our health. Uh, I can take that one. Uh, the EPA does currently have some powers and does actually do some regulation of wood heater emissions, not from a greenhouse gas perspective, more of an air pollutant perspective. Um, I grew up in Armidale, which is freezing, so everyone has their wood heaters on in winter, so that's a hot spot. And I know the EPA has done pilot projects up there and does use their powers. But again, it's not for the purpose of climate change mitigation, it's done as a pollutant. But it just shows that, you know, they do have powers that they could use. Jacqueline would like to know if there are any parallel federal laws relevant to the New South Wales laws on this. Is there, I guess that could be, is there a federal EPA? There's no federal EPA at the moment. Uh, that's a bit of a hot topic because as you may have heard, federal environmental laws are under review at the moment and a number of people have called for a federal EPA and they've also called for national laws to more effectively address climate change. At the moment, there's not the federal EPA and there's not that legislation at the national level. So that's, that's another reason why it's so important to really empower state EPAs to do this kind of thing. And you may have seen in Western Australia, the EPA over there put out guidelines recently that were quite controversial, but there are really interesting developments mm -hmm. at the state level. And I think part of that is because of the lack of action at a federal level. Okay, Lady Nora would like to know if the EPA could ban um, government backburning and um, other hazard reduction burning um, due to its impacts on human health and climate change. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Look, I would say it's not something that we've looked at in this report, and I don't think it's something that we could answer here today on this webinar um, because we haven't looked at it in detail. Yeah, I think hazard reduction burning is actually regulated under different legislation. So uh, your fires, emergency services, rural fires legislation, that kind of thing. Uh, I th my understanding is the EPA is consulted and, and it is a very complicated process to work out how and when uh, hazard reduction burning can be done. And apparently it's very limited circumstances under which it is done. So it is a regulated process at the moment, but not under this legislation we're talking about specifically. So it's not addressed in, in, in this current report. The only thing I'd add to that is I think in, in one of the case studies in this report, um, one of the ex-fire chiefs does talk about the fact that climate change is having the effect of shrinking the window in which you can undertake safely hazard, re uh, hazard reduction burning. Um, and so some of the discussion about the need for increased hazard reduction burning as the solution to the problem of greater wildfires in the face of climate change, uh, that point is rejected um, on, on the basis that climate change is actually shrinking that window in which you, uh, at which time you can do it safely. And um, uh, Lady Nora makes the question, uh, makes the point that um, 
when hazard reduction burning isn't done safely, it can jump containment lines, it can have impacts on properties and things. Okay, Kerry makes the age old point that having the power to act does not mean that they will have the will to act um, and ask what we see might motivate the EPA to undertake the actions that we've outlined or recommended in, in the report. Um, well, perhaps I can, I can start with this one and then Sarah and Rachel can say anything they want to. I think that having a report like this, which articulates the powers that they do have available is the first step. A, because it makes the EPA explicitly aware of their own powers. Now you might be surprised, but I think often government agencies are surprised by the power they might have. Uh, and the second thing is that you would hope um, it increases the public awareness of those powers and the public pressure on them to actually use them to drive the um, rapid reductions we see as necessary. I think in terms of New South Wales at the moment, um, as I said in my introduction, the powers the EPA has and the recommendations that we include that urge them to use them actually complement what the New South Wales government is trying to achieve in creating a renewable energy superpower in New South Wales. Um, the actions that we recommend in our report um, sit effectively alongside that in terms of creating market-based mechanisms um, which move us more swiftly towards a zero carbon economy in New South Wales. And that is uh, very clearly the goal of Minister Keane. Um, it's as uh, Rachel pointed out, the bill last night that passed through parliament had uh, very much cross party line support with the exception of one nation. So it, it, it seems to me that you're right. There is always a question of will, um, but now does seem to be a moment where a lot of things are shifting. And I would include in that um, changes in geopolitics as well with the um, election of President-elect Biden, uh, which will have, have impacts around the world. Ben says that any economic instrument would cause complex issues at state borders. He asks whether any scheme could work without being adopted by all states. Yes, Ben, it could. Um, a lot of people are surprised to know that New South Wales has actually had an emissions trading scheme in the past. We had the Greenhouse Gas Abatement Scheme, GGAS, uh, a number of years ago. It was one of the first schemes in the world. Uh, and that, was, that wasn't administered by the EPA, it was administered by IPART in New South Wales. Uh, so if you go to our report, there's a bit of a, bit of a um, just some background on that, and that did actually successfully reduce emissions. So it can be done in New South Wales. Unfortunately, that scheme was ended when it looked like there would be a federal ETS introduced, but as you know, that, that didn't eventuate. So it can be done and it should be done. Ben has a, has a follow-up question, it's, it's related. Um, he's, he says, in New South Wales, a load-based licensing fee for um, CO2 from electricity generation, could that be <clears throat> that fee be added to the cost of electricity if it crosses state borders? That might be a bit technical, but maybe one of you knows the answers. I don't know the answer to that. Look, what I would say to that is, you know, putting a price on carbon through the load-based licensing scheme and the impact that that would have on electricity prices is definitely something that would need to be considered when you're designing the scheme and if you were to put it through in the load-based licensing framework. So as lawyers, we're, again, highlighting the legal opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and we don't admit to having all the answers here. Um, we suggested that any scheme that is um, developed in consultation with experts um, should include economists as well, but specifically in relation to the um, load-based licensing scheme, our um, report says specifically that consideration would also need to be given to the influence of LBL fees on the prices of electricity. And for example, whether imposing fees in New South Wales would have a perverse outcome of, you know, electricity generation from alternative sources such as brown coal from Victoria flooding the New South Wales market. So again, these are the type of issues that would need to be further considered as, as the idea of putting a load-based licensing um, fee on carbon would, would need to be, um, would be developed. So Dorothy, who had the question about um, 
Woodheaters says that um, the, the legislation currently isn't working because uh, new heaters are almost as polluting as older models um, and wants to know if there's a way to solve this problem using an existing mechanism. Uh, yes, with any, any law reform process, it can be relatively slow, but it's about getting the evidence and the information to EPA and putting the case forward for why, uh, why legislation is not working, why there is a need to strengthen it and get it, amassing that evidence about the impacts uh, and what needs to be done. So one of the, the roles of the EDO law reform work is exactly that, to identify what legislation's not working and make recommendations for reform, but it can be a, a slow process. Uh, so it does take stamina. That's all the questions we have. Um, if you have a question um, for our panelists, please type it in and I'll ask it before we finish up. Oh, here's one. There's two actually, they're coming in now. Joe asks, have there been any legal actions against the EPA for failing to protect people from environmental pollution? Uh, to, Joe, to answer that as a, as a, as a broad question, there, have, there has been litigation brought against the EPA over time for a number of reasons. Um, I'm going to go back to my initial um, comment about litigation, which is because we have a matter against the EPA for clients before the court. So I won't, um, uh, I won't go into any more detail about um, that litigation or any other in this webinar. Lady Nora also has a follow-up question about hazard reduction burning. She's asking, can you ask the EPA um, to ban such things like hazard reduction burning and back burning that are increasing climate change impact? Is it possible to do that? Uh, well, look, I, I don't accept that um, Aboriginal hazard reduction burning or hazard reduction burning as a general, uh, a, 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 that it should be banned as a matter of course. Um, I, I don't think that, um, I've read anything that suggests that it's not appropriately used in some circumstances, but I think it falls outside of the remit of what this particular report is commenting on, um, which is really looking at the EPA's ability to control um, emissions from other sources rather than emissions that might be generated in terms of uh, in terms of carbon or in terms of any other that might be occasioned by hazard reduction burn. Oh, Mary asks, um, how can the EPA um, regulate the Narrabrite gas project and the, the proposed gas precinct in the Northwest? Sorry, David, did you want to speak to oh, that? Go ahead. Look, um, what I would gonna, what I would be saying is that um, that project's been approved um, here in New South Wales and recently by the Prime Minister Lay at Commonwealth level. Um, you know, the EPA would need to use its existing powers, and I guess what we're talking about here is something that um, the EPA isn't doing yet. So I think that the application to the Narrabri gas project of this report um, is limited um, just because of where that project's up to at the moment. Um, not sure if David or Rachel wanted to say something more about that. No, it will more than likely need, that project will need an environment protection licence. Um, but I don't, I think you made the point that they were current, they're currently not being used to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Is that your view? Yeah. Kate asked, do we know how these perspectives that you've outlined in the report, Sarah, and transfer to other states and their EPAs? Uh, it's a good question. Um, the, each state has different legislation and we've looked specifically at the legislation here in New South Wales, but it would be an, an interesting task 
to to carry out the same exercise, looking at the legislation in other jurisdictions around Australia. And um, maybe in the new year, if we've got a bit, you know, a bit of time, that's something that we or others can do. But at this stage, um, we focused specifically on the New South Wales EPA. And because the legislation is each, in each state is different, what we're recommending here and the mechanisms that we've identified here may or may not be applicable in other jurisdictions. We would need to go back and look at the specific uh, legislation in each of those jurisdictions. Danielle is having trouble finding the report on our website. Um, could we provide a link to the report in the chat by any chance? Maybe Rachel can do that. Um, Danielle, we will put it into the chat function to all participants, hopefully. Um, let us know if that doesn't come through to you. I did also have it on one of the slides, so I might just bear with me, pop back. There it is there. Hopefully you can all see that now. And we're just about out of time, Jim. Unless there's okay. anything else, we might um, leave them with the link to the paper there. Um, yep. There's no further questions, Saren. So if that's the case, I'd like to thank you all for coming um, to our webinar. Um, Em, can I say a final thing? Yeah. I was just going to say we're really, really lucky at EDO to have uh, such a calibre of lawyer as Saren, who's been the lead author on this report. And as you've got a snapshot of today, she has waded through some very, very technical legislation to find these solutions. So I just want to say thank you for Saren for being the lead author on this and encourage you all to have, have a look through the report and, and get back to us if you've got more questions. Sorry, Jem, go on. Uh, you pretty much said what I was going to say. I really encourage you to read the report. It's got some excellent analysis of the, the current powers. I was incredibly surprised to see what was available to the EPA in, term, in terms of um, regulatory tools. And I'm sure you will be too. She's set it out very clearly and it's very easy to understand. So I'd encourage you to have a read. Um, and if that's all I'd like to, yeah, just thank you all for coming and um, we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Saren. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Bye-bye.